All right, let's turn to Matthew chapter 22 this morning. Book of Matthew chapter 22. We are on the last letter of the Baptist acrostic. We talked about the two officers, which was the second to last uh, letter, the letter T. Now we're up to the letter S, which is the last one. And this one is a pretty, um, I did, there's a lot of stuff that I found on this one, so if we have to go into two lessons, that's okay. Uh, there's no need for us to rush. And if there, is this, if there are some questions, uh, feel free to, to ask. Uh, let's bring up some discussion. All right? We're going to start with Matthew chapter 22. We'll look into other ones, other passages, but we're going to start with this one. It says in verse 15, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. Talking about Jesus. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar, or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness, and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Let's ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Father, thank you for the last several months we've been looking into the Baptist distinctives and we find in your word why we are a Baptist church. Lord, the Bible has shown us these things and we're thankful for that. I ask, Lord, that you help us to be a church that is uh, faithful to the Bible, faithful to what it says. Lord, teach us your word. We need to learn from you. We need to grow. We need to apply these things in our lives. Please help us this morning as we dive into this subject. Lord, help me to be simple and not complicated. I ask you to give me understanding on how to explain this. Help me to... Um, I need your filling of the Spirit. I trust you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. What a scene in the life of Christ in the book of Matthew that we're in. You find the Pharisees having a little powwow, uh, having a little secret meeting. How do we get him to say something wrong? And they were just thinking, how do we do it? And they try to butter up Jesus in verse 16. The Master, we know that thou art true. What liars? Liars. They were flattering him. That's why Jesus says, Why tempt ye me, you hypocrites? Why are you playing this game with me? Jesus, it, it says he perceived their wickedness. He knew their intention. And we need, a, we need to understand that Jesus knows our intentions too. He does. And it behooves us to ask him to purify our motives when we do something. So he is asking them to give him a, a, a penny, a piece of money. And on this piece of money is an image of Caesar. Because Caesar was in charge at the time. Jerusalem was under the rulership of Rome. Rome was growing in its military power. Uh, maybe 50 to 60 years later, they would own, they would rule the entire Mediterranean area. 
from Spain all the way to Jerusalem. That's a large piece of land. Okay. So he asked him, Who's, does this, whose image is this? Caesar. And he gives him an amazing answer. We're going to study this in a little bit. Whose image is this? It, it's Caesar's, of course. So then he says, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. We're going to study this passage a little bit deeper in a few minutes. But I want to give you some historical background on what separation of church and state is. Back in 1788, a Baptist pastor from Virginia named John Leland, he's the man on the left, he was good friends with James Madison. James Madison is the author, or the architect, if you will, of the United States Constitution. He wrote it. He would later be the fourth president of the United States. These men were very close. John Leland urged James Madison to include a Bill of Rights to the proposed Constitution of the United States. John Leland said this to him. He said, quote, Let freedom of religion lead all the rest in the Bill of Rights. In other words, let the freedom of religion be the very first thing in the Bill of Rights, which would later give a foundation for the rest of the rights that you and I cherish today. This meeting led to the first Congress ratifying the First Amendment in our Constitution. And this is what it says. This is the beginning sentence. Quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This simply means that the federal government is not to choose or force a state religion on its citizens and restrict people of faith from freely exercising their faith. This is huge. This is huge. And as believers, we thank God for this right in our law. It is a blessing. Other believer, believers in other parts of the world would love to have this law. The first century church did not have this either. So we are blessed. We need to thank the Lord for this right. Congress is not allowed to impose any religion on anybody, nor is it, to, nor is it allowed to restrict its citizens from freely exercising their faith. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, where did this, this uh, phrase, separation of church and state, come from? Where did it come from? This is a very good question. In 1802, several years later, the Danbury Baptist Association Dan in Danbury, Connecticut, they were concerned that they as believers, first of all, would have their freedom of religion restricted. Thomas Jefferson was in serious correspondence with them. They were sending letters to each other about this very issue. At the very last letter to them, Thomas Jefferson wrote this. It's a long quote, but I think it's important. I'll read it for you. It says, quote, he's telling the Danbury Baptist Association, these, pa these pastors from Danbury, Connecticut. He said, quote, believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that's individual soul liberty, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions. I contemplate, he's saying, I'm, I, I take this seriously, with sovereign reverence, that act of the whole American people, which declared that their legislature, or Congress, the American people want Congress to do this, quote, make no law 
respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's the First Amendment. Thus building a wall of separation between church and state. In other words, Thomas Jefferson was assuring the Danbury Baptists that he agrees with them that the state should have no preference of or influence on any religion. And that the First Amendment of the Constitution was sufficient to protect their religious liberty. He said, don't worry, the First Amendment will protect you. That is where, from this letter, we get the phrase, separation of church and state. The state cannot impose anything on the church. And we're going to see later that the church should not be a part of the state. We'll talk about that later. Any questions on this point? Okay. This is the historical foundation for, for us as Baptists that we hold to separation of church and state. Now we're going to get into what the Bible teaches about it. What does the Bible say about the church's relationship to the state, we're going to consider this passage that we just read. The first, this is the first one. Okay? Here's the question. Is it lawful to pay taxes unto Caesar? That was the question that the Pharisees asked. Now, Jesus has two choices. He could either say yes, or he could say no. If he said yes, let's analyze this for a second. He would have made himself to be a friend of Rome. And Palestine at that time was not friendly to Rome. They did not like Rome. Okay? And Jews would have hated him for the wrong reason. That's not why Jesus came. to side with Rome. He came to set people free from their sins. Okay? But what if he said no? Let me ask you, before I, before I move on. Let's think. If he said no, what do you think would have happened? Okay. Very good. Very good. He would have encouraged a rebellion against Rome. And again, that's not why Jesus came. That's not why he came. He didn't came for political reasons. He came for spiritual salvation. He would have also encouraged his followers to disrespect G uh, civil authority. And here's, in here's, this in here's in something interesting, and I want you to think about this. Here, they don't like Rome. They ask him, you know, is it should we really pay tribute to Caesar? But then, when Jesus stands with before Pilate in John, Pilate tells the Jews, he, he says, Shall I crucify your king? Does anybody remember what the Jews' responses were? They said, We have no king but Caesar. What hypocrisy this was. That was hypocrisy that the Jews demonstrated in front of Pilate. They hated Caesar, but they showed Pilate, no, we actually respect him, he's our king, not Jesus. Utter hypocrisy. But Jesus says here in verse 21, Render therefore, if, if you find a penny that has Caesar's um, image on it, and you are required by law to give this to Caesar, render it unto him. Verse 21. Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Based on Jesus' response to the Pharisees, as believers, listen carefully, we are to give that which belongs to our leaders, while also giving God what belongs to him. Give what belongs to our leaders, while also giving to God what belongs to Him. You have a question, Pastor Me? Uh, what was that? What was that? 
Uh, I think this is a good opportunity, too, to look at Jesus' wisdom and answering as Pastor Post brought out this morning. Uh, they, by their questions, tried to put them in, tried to put Jesus into a catch-22. Mm -hmm. And you as believers often find yourself in religious discussions, uh, whether through soul winning witnessing or, or perhaps talking to a friend or someone who's just being a smart aleck who thinks they're smarter than you. And uh, they will ask you questions that are a catch-22. Catch-22 is that, that kind of question where you can't win if you say yes and you can't win if you say no, right? Have you stopped beating your wife yet? That's the famous one. How do you answer that? You say yes, it assumes that you're beating your wife, so they know that you're still beating your wife. So there's no, there's no good answer for that if you, if you just rely on that didactic thing. Now, what Jesus did was uh, rise in that he parsed four people this answer in a very clever way, and you and I can also learn from that to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. <clears throat> because what Jesus did is different than what we call spin today. You know, what we have spin is, is an evasive tactic that you often see in politics. You know, whoever is in the White House, the, uh, either the president or his press secretary will be asked questions, and they will spin it, right? And that's, that's a, an American expression that came along during the, the 90s with a, a, uh, a president who had a very clever spinster and where they would take hay and spin it into gold, so to speak. But there was an expression a little older, which is more derogatory, which you would spin into gold. Mm -hmm. So it's different than a clever misdirect. Because that's what spin is. You're, you're really trying to hide something. You're trying to... Uh, you're trying to, to cover your true intentions with spin. But what Jesus did was even more clever because he wasn't covering his true intentions. He was speaking truth. Mm -hmm. He spoke truth in a very clear way where through his, his approach, through his wisdom, he was able to satisfy uh, both the yes and the no answer in a very clever and meaningful way that has given us our Bible study this morning. It's and Jesus wasn't trying to be subversive, mm -hmm. and he wasn't trying to cover any of his true feelings. Mm -hmm. but rather, he gave them a very clever and clarity, uh, clear perspective on the subject, uh, which which is, of course, profoundly affected, as Pastor Chris has pointed out right here. See, you know, the American culture today. You see, the there there's there are three arc, there are three opinions about Jesus, and uh, one apologist uh, in the 20th century suggested this. Some people say that he you have there are three opinions you can have about Jesus. He, you can either say he's a liar, a lunatic, or he actually says who he is, Lord. Jesus was no lunatic. He was very smart. <laughs> I mean, talking to the religious leaders at, at their day, who, in their day, in his day, who knew the Bible, the Old Testament, supposedly, and the laws that were there, and he just kind of snuck behind in the back door, uh, logically, so to speak, and showed them, hey, this actually holds no weight. Jesus was very intelligent. And... Uh, so he's, he was no lunatic. We, I'm so thankful that he knew how to respond to those who did not believe. Laura, this is the first passage. We're going to look at a second passage. Go to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. This is Jesus standing before Pilate. This is his tribe. Okay? His Roman tribe. Who would like to read for me verses 35 and 36? 35 and 36. Go ahead, Sam. Pilate answered, and Pilate answered, I, Am I a Jew? Thy own nation, nation, and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What have, hast thou done? Jesus answered, 
My kingdom is of this world. If my kingdom is of this world, then it will not be of this world. That I should not be delivered to you, but now is my kingdom not of this world. Okay, thank you, Sam. We're in John chapter 18. We're talking about the issue of separation of church and state. The last Baptist distinctive. Here's the question that we need to ask. And we need to answer, excuse me. Of what kind of kingdom is Jesus king? Verse 36 is where we're going to hone in, okay? What is Jesus saying to Pilate? He has two kingdoms here. He talks about an earthly kingdom and then his own kingdom. You see two different kingdoms here. Let's talk about earthly kingdoms. Let's think about this. You see, earthly kingdoms have armies to defend their sovereignty. Any nation that exists must have an army to, to protect itself. It has a right to have to its own sovereignty. Therefore, it must defend itself, meaning it needs an army. But here's the thing. Their kings need protection from captors, assassins, mercenaries. You find throughout history examples of kings who were very, very powerful, but were actually quite vulnerable, even though they thought they were all powerful. You find one king in the Bible in the Old Testament named Sennacherib, who was the who was very close to conquering Jerusalem uh, under, uh, during the time of King Hezekiah. God delivers Jerusalem from Sennacherib's um, army by sending an angel that slaughters 185,000 soldiers in one night. Sennacherib hears of this. He's decimated. And uh, shortly after that defeat, uh, you find in the Old Testament, I believe it's in the Second Kings, that um, both of his sons kill him. Kings think that they have all power, but they're very vulnerable. But here's the thing about the heavenly kingdom. You see, the heavenly kingdom doesn't need a physical army to defend its sovereignty. And also, its king doesn't need protection from assassins or revolutions. Here, and, and, and the reason why I say that is because of how Jesus responds. He's so calm, even in the midst of being crucified and, and being physically... Um, he's going to be in physical pain very, very shortly, but you can, you can tell he's in very, he sounds very calm. My kingdom is not of this world. I'm not worried. He doesn't need protection from assassins or revolution, even in the midst of people who want him dead. Here's what I'm trying to say. This is what we need to understand as believers, as a church, as the one with all authority and power in heaven. Jesus is not at all concerned about human governments and their armies. Neither should his church be. No matter how ruthless governments can be, the church should rest in its head. And one day, he will make everything right. He will. Read Revelation. He will make everything right. We don't need to worry. Governments can get away with corruption, but they think they can, but one day they won't. He will take into account. He's keeping record. Let's trust the Lord. And we find in the first century... They didn't, again, they didn't have a constitution that, protect, that had a Bill of Rights that protected them. They were under Rome, and whatever Rome said went. They learned to trust the Lord even in spite of psychopaths for emperors. Read Roman history, you find some of these emperors were nuts. Like Nero. In the... In, in biblical times, in the, in the days of the New Testament, he was a Caesar. He was a nutcase. Now, is a state church biblical? This verse 
gives us two, shows us two things. Number one, Jesus separated man's kingdom from God's kingdom. And he made it clear, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not earthly. And also, this is what you need to understand. When the state weds the church, it makes Christ's kingdom earthly and physical. Now, here's a question for you. Does the Bible teach that Jesus will one day have an earthly physical kingdom? Yes, it does. But he won't need the state to do that. And he won't need the church to do that either. He will do that himself. Read Revelation 19, how it all starts. And, I, and, I, and I'm waiting. <laughs> I'm waiting. So, simply put, a state church is not biblical. It's not biblical. Okay, before I move on, any questions or comments up to, up to this point? Okay, we're going to look at a third verb, of a third um, passage. Romans chapter 13. And I just want to reiterate, if we don't finish this lesson, that's okay. We can, we can um, uh, continue next week. Romans chapter 13. I want you to keep in mind here that Paul is writing to believers who were living at the seat of military and political power at the time. Rome. Okay? And he's going to give them instruction on how to, how to deal with civil authorities. How does Paul instruct his readers concerning civil authority? We're going to start in verse 1. I'll read it. It says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. We're going to look at this passage verse by verse here. Verse 1 is basically telling us this. Every Christian is to submit to the powers that be because God put them there. Point blank. That is what he's saying. Now this would probably put some question marks in the minds of the Roman Christians here because they know that Nero was in charge. This would be very difficult for them to do. But he says very clearly, be subject unto them. Because they were ordained of God. God instituted government. Verse 2. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. If a Christian resists against them, they are resisting against God. Verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then be, not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. If rulers terrorize evil, and you commit evil, and he's talking to believers, shouldn't you fear them? If government has the right, the authority to exercise um, its power in times that it needs to, we should there should be some healthy fear about that. Rome had a policy. So long as it's the, the people that it conquered respected their rules and obeyed its laws, they were fine. However, if someone or some people in their empire tried to cause a problem, they were not afraid to use their authority. You will find that in 70 AD in Jerusalem. They decimated Jerusalem. And ever since then, there has, never, there has not been a temple. Rome was not afraid to exercise its power. Verse, we're going to skip down to verse 5. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, not only because of their, their, the wrath that they, can, um, that they can exude, but also for conscience sake, for your own sake. We are to submit to them, not because 
only of the wrath that they can exercise, but because it's right. It's right. Paul, Peter, in 1 Peter, he even goes further. He says it point blank in chapter 2. He says, fear God, honor the king. And who was the king at the time? Caesar. And verse 6 and 7 is very clear. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. One application from verses 6 and 7 is simply pay your taxes. Christians should not be involved in tax evasion. That's dishonest. That is sin. Point blank. We need to do right by our leaders in paying our taxes, even though we don't like it. That is a way we respect our leaders. So, simply put, um, Paul here is telling us we need to respect our leaders. Respect them. We may not like them. We may not even agree with them. And that's okay, especially in the country that we live in with all the, 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 the rights that we have. It's okay. But above all, even if you disagree with them, respect them. And Paul is going to even go further with this in 1 Timothy 2, which we will close. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy 2. All right. This is Paul instructing a young pastor. And he's instructing this young pastor how to teach the church what to do with when it comes to our leaders. Verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, a.k.a. Caesar, and for all that are, that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, he's saying point blank, as believers, we need to pray for all. But he gives one specific application for kings and those that are in leadership. And here's the reason why. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. It, I do not believe that means so, so that we can live with, uh, in peace with, with government. Because being under persecution is not really living in peace and quiet. I believe what he's saying here. You are to pray for, for your leaders so that in your conscience you know you are in good standing with your leaders even though they may be in persecution. You are in persecution. God is pleased, verse 3. He says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. God is pleased when he sees his people praying for those who lead the state. When they do, they can live lives of true inner piety and honesty before their leaders, even in times of fierce persecution. In their heart of hearts, they know they're doing right by their leaders, even though they are under persecution. Do you want to be persecuted for, for Christ's sake or because of something you're doing wrong? I hope it's because of Jesus, not because of something you or I are doing wrong when it comes to the state. We're not to be persecuted, huh? mm -hmm. Okay? We don't like persecution, and that's fine. That's understandable. But Jesus even, but he tells us in the, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are you who are persecuted for my name's sake, not because of sin. Now, Final conclusions. Several points here. And then we'll close. <sighs> Number one.
Give the state what is due to it. Taxes. Respect. Honor. When it comes to what government does or doesn't do, rest in the one who is in full control. Rest in Jesus. He is king. And he will make it right one day. Number three, so long as it doesn't order you to disobey God, submit to the state and respect its authority. If the government tells us to disobey God in some way, then we will have to say with Peter and John, like Peter and John, we ought to obey God rather than men. Okay? We need to obey the Lord. He is our master. He is our king. So long as they don't do that, though, be a good citizen, a godly citizen. Fourthly, pray for those who are in positions of authority. Pray for them. And our leaders need prayer. They do. They do. They're under pressure, and their decisions can impact millions of people. Any final questions or comments before we close? Okay. I trust this was a help to you. Uh, chew on this. Chew on this. Okay? We need, it. we need to respect our leaders and pray for them. All right, let's close in prayer. Father, Lord, we are thankful that we live in a country where we have freedom of religion. We live in a nation that in some measure respects separation of church and state. Where the church does not become the state, nor does the state supposed to influence or have power over the church. We live in a nation where we can exercise our faith freely, without hindrance. Lord, we're thankful for that. We are a blessed people. Believers in this nation are blessed. Thank you, Lord, for that freedom. I pray that you would help us to use this freedom to give the gospel and to live righteously. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world that do not have this. I pray that you would uh, empower them, embolden them to give the gospel even in the midst of intense persecution. Lord, help us to pray for our leaders, to respect them, even though we might not agree with them. Lord, help us to be the godly citizens that you want us to be. A godly church that respects the state because of its authority. Because you put them there. Bless the morning service to come. We look forward to what you will do among us in Jesus' name. Amen.